Hey guys, welcome to this one box review. Today we're going to be taking a look at a kit from Asuka Models, or formerly known as Tasca, and that is the 135th scale British Sherman VC or 5C Firefly. So the Firefly series, which was both made on the uh, 1C hybrid and 5C chassis, I think the 1C was the M4A1, I believe, and the 5C was the British designation for the M4A4. It was a homegrown attempt by the British military to basically upgun the 75mm stock barrel from the Sherman with actually a gun capable of killing the German heavy cats. And their solution was to mount a whopping big gun into a very small turret. And this is, of course, the 17 pounder, which is roughly about a 3 inch gun. With its armor piercing discard and sable ammunition, I think if I remember correctly, it was tungsten core ammunition. It was capable of knocking out basically anything at 500 meters. Even the really heavy German Jag Tigers and all that, its ammunition could do it. However, the problem was the ammunition, uh, such as uh, APDC, the discarding sable rounds, were horribly inaccurate. Um, one study said if you're shooting at anything over three or 500 meters or 300 meters, don't bother. So even though the ammunition and the gun was good, it was just very, very inaccurate. Yeah, um, this type of ammunition technology was still quite young in its development, so it was still going to be many decades before the sables that we know, which is the depleted uranium sable uh, that can basically punch through anything, uh, was born. However, this did give the beleaguered British armoured regiments something mobile, on demand, that could deal with um, German armour. Normally, not always, of course, it was always the exceptions. It was just maybe as a rule of thumb. So out of a squadron of five tanks, one tank would be a Firefly. So you'd had four standard Sherman 5s uh, with their 75 millimeters, and then one Sherman Firefly, or 5C. The C, you'll see in every Firefly model, when you see their designation, you will see the, the letter C. So it'd be 1C, or IC or 5C or VC, and the C is actually the designation for a fakel equipped with a 17 pounder gun. So just before we wrap up this little introduction to this very interesting fakel, <laughs> another challenge the British found when trying to mount this gun into this relatively small turret was they couldn't fit the bloody thing in. So they had to turn the entire breech assembly on its side to try to get it into the turret mantlet. And they, they did it, they finally, they managed to do it. It took a, took a little bit of work to get it to work for them, but they did it. Then they found out there was no space left in the turret, so they had to build a separate compartment and cut out the back of the turret to put the radio equipment in and also install a bit of a counterweight just to help uh, even out the handling of the gun, because it is a long barrel as you can see. And then they also found that the gunner was totally hemmed in by the breach. He could not get out in a hurry, so the fecal got hit. And bear in mind, it's still a Sherman chassis, so its armor still is vulnerable to most anti-tank weapons. He can't get out in a hurry, should anything catch on fire, so they actually had to cut into the turret roof and install him a purpose-made escape hatch. That said, even though it was ever only really meant to be designed as a stopgap measure, it did the job that was needed to do, and it did it well enough to keep it in service. There is a lot of debate, why did Americans not actually adopt the 17 pounder Firefly idea with their own? And there's a whole lot of kind of theories to why that is. You know, some say the ammunition, they didn't want to um, basically retool their factories to make foreign ammunition, blah de blah de blah. And there is elements of truth in those. But the real reason was they didn't need it. They had their 76 mil and 90 mil guns. and. Uh, the truth of the matter was those guns, such as the Sherman E7 and E8s, were capable with their own armor-piercing armor ammunition and sable ammunition, though they never actually had that much sable. Often armor battalions might only be given three sable rounds per tank, because obviously tungsten was used in tooled uh, uh, um, mach uh, machining and what have you, so it was more important not to be literally like shooting expensive material out of a gun barrel, instead you could be using it to make tools to win the war. So that's the real probably reason why the Americans never adopted this Firefly. It was simple fact being is that they had their own home ground stuff that could do the job. The real problem was it wasn't the gun, it was a tank. The tank, even though the Sherman is actually a very good tank, it just did not have the armor protection to really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Tiger. Uh, it could potentially 
uh, go toe to toe with a panther for about five minutes before the panther blew it to pieces. But that is just here and over there. Anyway, that little history spiel out of the way. What do we get in this kit? Well, we get a relatively narrow box. Tascar or Suka models, Shermans are probably seen as the best on the market. And I do hope to get a few more of these over the next couple of months because I do like me and my Shermans. So we get final rubber band tracks, which um, I was a bit disappointed, but we'll see can we actually get them to work. Um, for once, I might actually try to see can I get final tracks to work. We do get workable suspension, which is pretty damn cool. That's actually interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that works. And then we have some photographs of the build-up model. So, let's crack open the box and see what we get. Okay, looking at the instructions. Standard uh, Explorer Diagram booklet. So, it starts off immediately with assembling the tracks, which are final rubber band style. They're in two parts, so that should be... That might be a little bit interesting um, to, uh, to how that's going to actually go together. It is asking us to cut elements of the track, so I'm not entirely sure what they mean there. Of course, everything is in, um, for the most part, Japanese. There is a little in English to um, basically uh, help us along. Then we go straight onto the running gear. There is some small parts that do have to be added, like such as squeeze nipples and what have you. Not too, not too bad. Then we go on to step five has us building um, the suspension buggies. They are movable somewhat. They are, um, they are kind of, they give us kind of rubber felt to put into the area to make these move. It's kind of cool. Then we move on. Step six here goes on to the assembly of the lower hull. Now, the hull is not one piece. I should have to build it up uh, several pieces to make the lower hull tub. This may cause issues. I, I can maybe see this a little bit tricky. If you're not careful how you do your alignments, you might uh, miss a line here. Um, however, I'm sure that they're actually well keyed, so you're not going to like um, disjoint parts. Well, they can only hope for the best. Then we go on to the rear deck, where the engine access panels are. So we move on to uh, the smoke dischargers, I believe, with the, and they're the smoke generators. And... Um, the engine access panels, very nice. Then we move on to, uh, again, the second assembly for the rear deck. We have a big four witch grill here, um, an optional tow hook if you so wish. Again, everything's free clearing, so there shouldn't be any issues here. Then we have the differential, um, or the basically the transmission um, uh, housing mount. Uh, we have our deflector assembly, wherever that is. <laughs> I've forgotten a lot of things about the Sherman. It's been a while since I, re I researched them. Upper hull. What I like about this assembly is it's not too busy. Each step isn't bombarding you with, with steps or parts. That's good. Then we have the then we have the mounting of the various parts. So our transmission, our rear deck and upper hull all coming together. That's when you know if you've done it right or not. Mounting of the driver and uh, loader or co-driver's hatch. In uh, in the Firefly there actually is no bow gunner. They uh, they booted him and replaced his space with ammunition. So it's just a driver. So if you, if you are modeling this uh, in an advanced column or column of march, uh, don't have a head sticking out of the bow gunner's position because he isn't there. Upper hull uh, assembly. So we have the armoured plugs for where the bow machine gun used to be. We have the mounting of the hatches, the headlights. I think the headlight assemblies, yeah. The headlight guards are on photo wedge, which is a nice uh, nice feature. They can be a little bit hard to form. Um, these can be a little bit annoying, but use the plastic part. Uh, or actually, I think it gives us, um, I think it actually gives us uh, a means to bend that to shape. So we'll see when we actually come to the parts. Engine deck assembly again has this drilling couple of holes here to mount parts. Very much like a Tamiya kit, there is a lot of drilling. Um, and actually, has a, the instructions really do have a feel um, maybe slightly more busier than a Tamiya kit, but the most certainly do feel like Tamiya. Then the uh, mounting of the Pioneer tools and the uh, crew bin. Step 18 has us putting in our suspension buggies and our idler in return or um, 
yeah, our driving, our drive spot and return, or idler, should I say, and tracks. Then we're moving up onto the turret. We still have a little bit more work yet to do. We do have the, um, we do have options if we want to include the side skirts. I'm actually going to leave off the side skirts. I think they're ugly. Um, I might actually, well, I'll probably put the side skirts onto an Alana main Sherman I might do in the future, but uh, I don't think it suits the firefight all that much. Then we move on to the gun. The gun is a four part assembly, unfortunately. I don't know how well you guys can see. Um, so the muzzle brakes are two parts, barrels in two parts, dies. The real letdown on this kit is that. Um, however, there are a skew of aftermarket parts for this. Like um, RB does a replacement one piece aluminium and brass muzzle brake. I would strongly recommend picking up something like that. Um, because especially on the, the shape of the the uh, muzzle brake, that might be a little bit hard to fill without uh, sanding off detail. And like I'm normally all for using kit barrels and just spending a little bit of time sanding them up and, and making them look pretty. But uh, yeah, uh, that's just aftermarket that if you do want to save yourself the butter. Mounting of the mantelet, very basic breech block and a coaxial machine gun. That's kind of all that's really there. Mounting of the gun shield. Then we have the commander's hatches, the big counterweight um, on the rear of the, the tank. Then actually the turret itself, the mounting of the gun, cheek armor, um, the, gr the grenade port um, or the pistol port. I believe in some cases they welded these shut, so I think you have the option. Um, so do convert to your um, your resources there. Even actually the photograph they have here actually shows it being welded shut. Just add a little bit of security to fill it and then and weld it over, try to give a bit more rigidity to the turret. Then we have the the hatches, kind of a not weird looking assembly for the loader's hatch to keep it open. Still it's cool detail. The um, commander's aiming fane is also included, that is really cool. We have a searchlight, another um, aiming device I think that is. I can't quite remember what that is. Should, but I can't. So anyway, so that's 24. 25 is the final assembler. And that is basically the commander. It does come with a commander, which is kind of cool. We'll have a look at him in a few minutes. And the mounting of the, the turret. And we do get um, a wire rope. Actually, no, we don't. We don't. We get the length of it. So the tow cables I even fucking included. Thanks, lads. Such a cock tease. Anyway, continuing to move on, we have our marking guide. Once again, in Japanese. It's kind of cool. It actually shows us the, the formation here of a regiment. So our different troops. So we have a commander's vehicle, or OPs. And then we have... Um, each troop has three normal. Okay, so it's not it's not five vehicles; it's four vehicles then. So they have three normal Shermans and then one Firefly in each one. It's kind of cool. I wish I was in English because it would have been interesting to read up on that. So our first one is uh, A Squadron, Twenty Fourth Lancers, Eight Armor Brigade, June nineteen forty four. Again, just standard olive green or dark green. They do paint their machines slightly differently to the Americans, I believe. B Squadron, Staffordshire Yeomany, Yeoman, Yeomanry, or however the hell you pronounce that. 27 Armour Brigade, July, Normandy, 44. 1st Squadron, 2nd Armour Regiment, 10th Cavalry Brigade, 1st Polish Armour, Spring, 1944, the UK. So that's kind of cool, actually, from the Polish vehicles. C Squadron, HQ, New Zealand 20th Armour Regiment, 4th New Zealand Armour Brigade, April 1945, Italy. Again, very cool. And that's, yeah, and that is our armour markings, kind of simple, but still nice selection nonetheless. Now I've gone ahead and I've bought myself uh, an aftermarket upgrade, and that is from Star Decals, which was once. Um, uh, Echelon models, I believe, or Echelon decals, or Bison. Is that a Bison or Echelon? I can't remember which one they were. So I bought one 
that allows me to do the guards armor division because I'm going to do an Irish guards firefly because you know you got to represent the home side. So quick look at these decals and we'll have a look at the kits ones immediately after this. Well, like these are aftermarket and these are some of the best there is. Like these are perfectly registered, high level of relief and detail, and these should go on quite nicely. We get a nice little. Um, uh, marking guide here so it tells you which type of um, element to use. I think the Irish Guards for a Junior Armour Regiment if I remember correctly. Uh, I need to do a bit more research here so I know what to use. So I'm going to be doing uh, 2nd Battalion Irish Guards Firefly from Operation Market Garden and that's what this project in the future will be. So the detail is actually really, oh wow these are very very well printed um, decals. So we have a super model 2006 because the original Firefly came out in 2006 even though this kit's marketed as 2015. These are actually really nice. Really really vibrant, good relief, slightly raised but I don't think um, it will make a difference. The carrier film does seem a bit heavy on some of the words so it'd be interesting to see whether that's silver or not. But still look pretty and damn nice. Very much like Tamiya's, and Tamiya's can be a bit temperamental. But these, I believe, are printed by Asuka themselves, it doesn't say anything else. So it's a nice full dental sheet. Not much to say here, but again, if you are building it out of the box, it shouldn't give you any issues. We do get a rather healthy photo etch fret, which is actually really bloody nice. So we'll, have, we'll go and have a proper look at this. So uh, we get our big engine grills, headlight lamps, the protective mounts for the periscopes, the rails for the side skirts, wherever the hell these things are. I think these are the um, smoke generators. I think that's what they're called. They're basically what mounts onto the access doors to the uh, engine compartment. I think what they do is eject fuel onto a deflector or something, something like that. I might be totally wrong there, but I'm pretty sure that's what they do. And if not, ah well. So that's that, that's nice. Now let's actually get down to the plastic. And there actually is quite a few sprues in this. They're not, it's not as many parts as I thought there was going to be in this kit, but um, still enough to keep us busy for a while. So we'll start off with the big sprues, which there isn't actually that many. So this is the components that make up the lower hull. We do have a detailed, um, we do have a detailed lower under hull, uh, so if you have this vehicle like turned on its side, you could possibly you could show it off if you want. Why ever you want to do that, I don't know. Then we have the side walls. I just want to have a look. Yeah, there isn't much in the way of locators for mounting the side walls onto the the hull. So just take your time putting this together because if you misalign this at this stage, you are well and truly banjaxed. But again, <coughs> detail is very nice. In the same type of olive plastic that we kind of come to know from Tamiya. It's pretty nice, you know, nothing too crazy. Some weird kind of swirling patterns in the plastic. That's just to do with the cooling of the of the, uh, the, the plastic. As in, when it's punched out of the moulds, it's not fully cooled yet. However, um, a coat of primer and paint, you won't see that. Detail is okay. I'm actually, I was expecting crisper. I, I will be honest, I was expecting somewhat crisper detail. For, um, because everyone goes on about Tasca, and or in this case Asuka, which is the same company. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's sharp, but not dragon sharpness. It is what it is. Not saying it's a bad kit, of course. Upper hull, much better detail than this. We even have foundry markings in between the two um, ha uh, crew hatches here. Wells are very nicely done. That's nice. I like seeing the foundry marks. That's good. Yeah, no, this is much. This is much sharper. This is actually a much better showcase of their detail. Again, no warpage, no flash. These are our sponsons. Pin marks on the inner faces. Doesn't really matter. You're not going to see any of them. Our turret itself has a very, very light cast texture. You might want to come back with some type of liquid putty and actually steeple that on, or stipple that on, should I say, because um, it's not really pronounced enough. These should have a pretty pronounced cast texture. 
But still, the defense is pretty nice. Do I see any foundry marks on the third? There should be. No. Okay, so you might, if you really do want to go all out and actually like um, super detail this, you might have to buy yourself a set of photo etch foundry marks. I think um, several companies just do sets of the various like um, foundry marks that actually uh, the factories that produce these machines. Lower hull, or sorry, the the mounts. Too weird. It's almost like they're at one point thinking of putting in a basket for this turret, but uh, there's none included, unfortunately. So yeah, the upper hull and turret are pretty impressive. Um, they might require a little bit of texturing, but nothing that a basic modeler cannot do. Besides, it's kind of fun adding that type of detail, if you ask me. Okay, so we'll just kind of get the bigger sprues out of the way, and then we'll move on to the smaller ones. So we have this sprue, and this has a bit of everything on it. So we have our transmission uh, housing. Again, a very, very light cast texturing, not enough to be accurate. That needs to be more substantial. So once again, you will be going back if you want to do it right and adding more to cast, cast texture. Because the majority of these vehicles had a, so a mixture of rolled steel welded or cast. And uh, the cast textures do actually add quite a bit to the model. We have our drive sprocket um, housings, or differential um, housings. The rivets that uh, basically rivet this thing onto the machine. So one actually the, the great advantage of Sherman was that it could be literally broken down as sub assemblies and replaced if something broke. Something that the, the German army didn't really seem to be interested in until it came to bite them in the arse. By building overly engineered vehicles for Sherman was very easy to maintain. We actually have a jig, which is class, for bending the photo etch headlight um, guards. That is really clever. So top marks to Suka for not being completely sadistic and making us do it ourselves. Tools, again, really nice. Not really much to say here. We have our our pistol port or close defense port. Could also be used for throwing shells out if you wanted to use it out. A um, little bit of a cast texture. It needs more because, again, they had a very prominent cast texture. Our applique armor and cheek armor. Not really much to say there. Commander's cupola, pretty nicely detailed. I actually see foundry marks and numbers. Again, very, very nice. I'm happy to see that. It's little details like that that do make the big difference. From very delicate handles and grab handles, the the crew kind of crowbar, if you will, or for changing, changing tracks is really delicate. So there it is. So watch out for that. It's for, it could be free to break that. Our exhausts are hollow, which is nice. Tammy don't give us those. And we have photo etch mount uh, griddles to put over those. Very nice. What else? Anything else are interesting? No, that's really it. So now we're kind of moving on to the smaller sprues. And there is actually quite a few of those. So the last of the true big sprues. Uh, so this is the sprue that has our two-piece gun barrel, our commander, and a few other turret related assemblies so we're going to have a proper look at all of it now so the gun barrel the 17 pounder gun barrel is in two pieces so unless you're willing to spend quite a bit of time cleaning those barrels up i recommend aftermarket it does give us two choices of muzzle brake but once again they're in two parts and there's a bit of flashing on them it's a bit of a shame. It's the first bit of flashing I've encountered in the kit so far. We have a very, very delicate looking um, radio mount. Oh, that's very well done. Um, I don't know how well you can see it. No, it doesn't want to be seen. It's here. That's very delicate and top marks for trying to reproduce that. It's going to be a nightmare to get that bastard out of the sprue, though. Then we have our mantlet and gun shield. Again, very light cast texture. We'll recommend go back and actually add it yourself, because once again, they did have a pretty prominent cast texture. 
our counterweight and radial um, compartment for the back of the turret is here. Again, nice detail. It doesn't, I'm not saying it's soft, but this doesn't seem to strike me as the same type of crispness as, say, a uh, Dragon Kid does. Then we move on to the Commander. It's nice it actually has a Commander, though he's quite flashy. He looks a lot like a Tamiya figure, actually. I actually thought he was uh, taken from maybe their Cromwell or their, or their Churchill kit. He's very flashy. The face, actually, we're going to have a proper look at him. So the face is not bad actually, it's not it's not a bad model. It does require a bit of filling and if you want just a, a basic figure and even you, he might even be a good um, figure to pr practice your painting skills on because the tanker uniform is very simple. It's just one colour. And of course he's wearing a beret. They did wear helmets too. Popular, um, like popular to the belief that only the US tankers wore like a crash helmet. The um, the British tankers too wore helmets, but their helmets looked a lot like their the British paratrooper helmets. Um, so they did wear crash helmets, but the Brits have this thing called regimental pride. It's just a bizarre notion where, if at all possible, always wear your braves. You see with the Royal Marines in the Paris all the time as well. Because you know, who needs head protection? So, that is that sprue. So pretty nice detail. It's, unfortunately the figure is a bit flashy, so that, that's probably some of the worst flashing in the kit I've seen yet. Now onto the mass of smaller sprues. So we get two of this sprue, which is our our drive sprocket and return um, idler or idler, should I say? We do have choices of sprocket, which is nice, and we also have a choice of in focus there, and we also get a choice of. Um, uh, idlers. I always forget what they're called. I know it's heresy, but I, can, I never remember it. And then we have a rotary. Really, that's interesting for the differential. Or the final. Actually, sorry, the final drive. I'm half asleep. Leave me alone. Uh, that's actually. It's it's geared. Okay, that could be interesting. Now you could maybe have the. For whatever reason, you could have the, the sprocket off. You know, you're doing that. That. Uh, mystical maintenance scene that everybody seems to talk about but no one ever seems to do so yeah okay I'll, I'll give them marks for that, at least it's something different and we get two of those sprues then we get three of these sprues and these are our, um, our buggies and our road wheels once again we have two options of road wheel, we got these solid cast ones and these hollow ones then we have our buggy assemblies these are pretty nice, actually pretty well detailed. Yeah, well, we have nice cast, not cast number, we have foundry markings on the actual, where are they? Where are they? Yeah, there we go. So we actually have cast and serial numbers on the buggies themselves. Because these are pretty much on everything on the Sherman, I swear to God, like everything was just numbered. You would absolutely go mad adding and numbering. We have rivets, actually you know, on the side of the sprue here, these are meant to be the tiny little grease nipples that are on the wheels. I am not putting them on. Because I can't do... God, no. I'll end up losing every last one of those. But at least they're there should you need them. We have our little return rollers that are built into the top again in shot. We have our little return rollers that are on the, built into the top of the buggies. Not really much to talk about on this. It's, it's pretty nice. It's... It's no real different or no worse. I think it's a little bit sharper than the, the Dragon. Dragon tend to kind of simplify their Shermans ever so slightly anyway. And we get three of those screws. And we're almost done. So we get two of this sprue, and this is just small little um, fittings. So we have our spotlight. Where is it? Oh, okay. So you get our spotlight to um, our headlamps, tow cables, the fuel caps, fire steam assure, which should be brass I believe on a British tank. Um, solid, that's, that's, that's a shame, they gave us solid um, plastic headlamp um, lenses, however I see lenses as well including the clear parts as well, so we do have an option there, whatever tickles your fancy of course. Periscopes, 
we get a little seat here maybe for the gunner our um, lifting eyes again where is it there we go sorry so we have our seat our fire extinguisher spare track links then back here we have our lifting eyes and it's identical on the other sprue we get this random thing that i haven't the slightest donkey notion what the hell oh i know what this is for this is actually you stack these up together and that's what creates the spring tension in the um the bogies if you want to have a working suspension and then the last part we have two small clear sprues the both of them are identical so we have we have clear lenses and then we have our periscopes it's pretty nice so there you have asuka models sherman firefly 5c in all it's a pretty good kit i'm actually quite impressed with it i'm actually look, quite looking forward to building this and it shouldn't be too long a build either nor should it be too taxing um and there's a whole skew of aftermarket upgrades for sherman's whether it be formation models resi cast legend all do quite extensive um sherman upgrades as well as uh, black dog and legend for doing um storage sets because you know shermans do look kind of cool when they're like laid into a kit so i will be picking up a few more shermans i will be probably doing an, an easy eight uh in some uh, sometime in the future i might do it up as fury because it's my favorite movie ever ha 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 anyway um thanks for watching guys stay safe as always happy modeling i'm out here for those buses bye bye